Hi everyone. My, my name is Raghu. Uh, I work as a principal architect at Flipkart. Um, I work on uh, with engineering cream that uh, delivers uh, any user facing services, uh, which includes the website and the mobile apps. So I kind uh, guess you can kind of guess who is to blame if the our site goes goes down and. Okay, that's uh, for those who are interested. I can hang around after this talk, and we'll talk about exactly what went wrong when people tried to buy. Precisely, I think it's this phone. Uh, yeah. So um, it's always great to be here at uh, Fifth Elephant. This is my third year in the running. I was here last year to talk about anyone from last year. We will be open source one of our systems called the Flipkart Phantom. Uh, so it, it was essentially a a fault resilience proxy uh, that we use on our website, and you'll see me talking about some of it, how we use it today as well. Uh, the year before last, uh, I came here to talk about Aadhaar. Uh, I was the principal architect of Aadhaar uh, in, from 2010. So uh, today's talk uh, is about Facebook-style notifications uh, using HBAs and event streams. Now, the intent or the motivation for this talk is essentially to share some of our learnings in building a, a real-time or near real-time notification system, uh, which hopefully uh, others in this audience would also like to build, uh, and and you know uh, sharing some of the learnings, patterns, and technologies that we use there. Now, before I go uh, in, onto the talk, uh, how many HBase users here? Okay, and how many using HBase to serve real-time? User interactive traffic. None? Why? You always know HBase as a columnar data store, the data is stored together, so you can do a lot of analytics. Yes? Right? So, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, how you can use HBase as one of the uh, technology elements in serving uh, user facing traffic. And probably as we go along, you'll probably, you might have even experienced this uh, feature at Flipkart. So the first one, um, it's about serving user intent, right? So the first, the top one is, uh, is a screen grab from an email that I got from Flipkart. Now, I don't think we have any of our marketing folks here. What were we even thinking when you sent such an email, right? Say, so stock up on daily essentials, get started. Yeah. So what am I telling you? Say, Flipkart is an e-commerce company buy stuff from us. Very low on intent. Uh, there's pretty much nothing we know about the user. You probably got your email when you browsed or you registered with us. Let's get to the second example, which is again another email that came from Flipkart, which said, you can buy school supplies at a certain percentage off and only for today. So it is time bound, uh, improved relevance, and it is derived Possibly from also a category of needy and recommendations, right? So it's becoming more relevant to uh, to a parent probably who's around the school uh, season. Now let's look at user intent in a completely different context. Say social, right? Uh, Facebook, Facebook likes, and some some of our friends here we know that even Mintra has a tagline and saying "living for likes." Am I right? Did I get that right? Live for likes. Any Mitra books here? Yeah. So, uh, a very, so, so what's so nice about this likes, right? So, Facebook, you put up a picture or a page and you just stay on the page. Why? You're just waiting for someone to hit a like on it or comment on it, right? Uh, there are two reasons why this is, uh, or multiple reasons, but two main callouts are it's quick updates from friends' actions on things that most affect you, right? So it's very personalized networks. It's very relevant in what the person is trying to do. Personalized. And, the, and an interesting thing is it's non-invasive, right? So you have this notification that comes up in, in, in Facebook. So you can consume it at, when you want to do it. So it's not like staring in your face like an email, right? So you, the advantage with this is uh, it's real time when you're in the app. And it can be pushed to you if you're using the, let's say, a mobile app, uh, and you can consume it at, at your own leisure. And what's so good for a company like Facebook would be that uh, they can actually get, or for that matter, even for someone like Flipkart, you can actually get more spammier, right? You can probably push lots more content than what probably the, 
the user would have seen if you sent him in this case 134 emails nobody is going to probably even read that now how can you apply uh, something like this to the flipkart context so i'm going to talk about this in app notifications anyone's used this feature on flipkart you add an item to your wish list you browse a product on flipkart and a price drop happens you're notified right now how does this drive intent uh, i was talking to another friend of mine he says he doesn't buy products he just adds it to wish uh, to his wish list and waits for the notification to say when when there's a price drop right so now we are engaging with the customer on one dimension which is uh, what is of interest to him now user intent here can be derived by just someone getting to a project product page right you search for samsung galaxy s3 you just went on to the product page you're logged in you know that look you like this product or you are somehow interested in this product stronger intent you add it to your wish list you say that some day i might want to buy this stronger still stronger intent you added it to your cart you still not decided to buy now these are the places where probably we sending you a notification might make you uh, make make a purchase right or we can also do it like after you have you have done a, so this is where it gets more we are trying to push content when you try to post buy you are trying to solicit a review you are trying to tell them that it's out for delivery and and so on and so forth right now the real uh, value for this is when this can be real time and when i say real time you are on to flipkart you browse a product or you add it to wish list you are still hanging around on flipkart and there is a seller out there who's probably you know got a new lot of samsung s3 phones and he reduces the price you're there on flipkart you get notified saying that hey there's a price drop right so the value is in really making this as real time as possible so what is a price drop uh, let's say notification so i need to build this up to say some of the design principles that really we applied is essentially you see a user sees a product at a certain certain price at a point in time and then he come and then the on one dimension the price is changing and the user comes back up or he's probably connected and now it's available at a different point in time right so all of these uh important transitions that have happened now one way to generate this quite easy so let's say you every time the user connects to flipkart uh and he's browsing or adding items to wish list you gather the user intent when he visits the next time you probably go and retrieve all the products that he has ever browsed or added to his wish list or his cart and then go and query the the product data store to say has there been price changes right now try to do this so our product catalog today is probably about 30 million and maybe we have updates of 5 or 6 million updates happening through the day and uh, again uh, the number of product page views that a user would be seeing or the number of times he is logging in would be in the order of a few millions so imagine running such a query again and again because and if you're trying to do this if you want it to be real time then it means you're constantly querying the, the same database right fetch all of his tens of products go to the product database see the price computer notification try to show it right right what's the problem with that it might seem that it's perceived optimal you're just querying the data when you want it right so that should be optimal in in, in basically in, in the kind of compute that you want to spend uh the cons are the gathering processing and serving of data is kaput at the big hit that you'll have on this is the latency that you're going to be able to serve the data to the user right and when he's probably logging on to flipkart maybe he's going to spend a couple of seconds on the home page if you don't show the notification he's probably navigated away from you right so you want that to be like extremely fast uh read path here is computationally expensive high latency we spoke about it importantly you also need versioning support in the product data because everyone has seen it at different points in time right so how do you get that right and another thing here is repeated computations right for a really popular product there might be hundreds of people who have seen the product so when everyone gets onto the page you're going and computing this again and again and again right now how can this change so if you really look at it the data here is is not really a user dimension it is actually a product dimension right all you are saying is look independently there is this 
this user came, saw the product, he probably added it to his wish list, something happened. And then there are these product price changes that are happening because a seller from Bombay got a new lot and he went and updated the stock. It has got nothing to do with the user or his act of seeing it at a point in time. Right? So it's not really. So if you see the data, so the, the consumer is, yes, the end user. But if you see the data dimension, it's actually a product dimension. So flip it around and say that, hey, why don't you instead compute these notifications as changes are happening in the system and just serve them out when the user comes onto the site. You suddenly, it changes a lot of things, right? Then when we set out to build this, we said that, look, it has to be extremely fast on the serving part, right? We want low latencies when the user is trying to retrieve the data. Uh, and 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 it, and and it is relevant, right? So let's look at what what it'll look like if we pre-create it real time and serve on demand. So what leads more? I mean, it's more of a step back thing. What leads to a notification, right? So you have an intent event stream. So when I say intent, it is users are browsing, adding to wish list, adding to cart. You have a number of these guys who are doing it, right? So you're browsing, and then you have a change event stream, which is all of these changes that are happening on the product in our in our supply chain systems, in our inventory systems, and so on. What really notifications is about is an intersection of these two streams, right? So that's what I meant by saying that, look, it's a it's a product dimension and not so much a, a user dimension, right? So what you need to do, therefore, is an intersection of millions of user event uh, intent and product changes. You with me on it? So what do we do? So uh, we say that, hey, we, we, we want to have an intent capturing system. So you capture the intent in some way. We'll come to specifics. Uh, you write it to a, a, a store, which is an intent store. And then you have an event processing matching system, which is also uh, receiving product changes. And you go and, and write it to the store. Now, here there's something called append. So this brings an interesting construct, right? Here, every event is immutable, right? The fact that you saw a product at a point in time is an event that occurred which is immutable. So, borrowing a term from data warehousing, it's a fact. It occurred. Right? So is a price change or so is any intent. So, look at, so let's say you were to able to, you had the ability to accumulate all of these, these events or these facts in a, in a store and then be able to, uh, you know, match them and create the intersection. Once you have the notifications, you can then serve out the notifications using a pull, push, a final delivery mechanism to be a web, email, a user on an app, you know, be what it is. So, patterns here, a uh, couple of patterns introducing here. So, we use uh, a staged event driven architecture and a variant of uh, the event driven architecture. Why is this? Because the event stream, so given that you have two streams that are coming in, they could be coming in at very different rates. And you don't want all of them to be consuming at the, at the same rate. And it just suddenly means that when there's a spike during the day when users are browsing the pages and your product changes are happening maybe at night, you're not trying to get both of them to process at the same time, right? So, uh, uh, a SEDA or whatever also allows throttling and allows consumption uh, in a certain, in a controlled manner. The other part where we're talking about intersection is really uh, a case for doing complex event processing. What that means is, so there might be thousands of users who are going and viewing the product, right? What is of interest is, hey, this person saw this product at this particular price. But the fact remains that there are maybe hundreds others who have seen the same product, right? So with respect to listening to changes on the product, you're na you're suddenly your, your, your scope narrows down to the top few products, right? So if you take a, a typical case, while we might have, and I'm just taking an example, 5 million product page views in a day, the number of products that are probably of interest on that day will probably be in a few thousands, right? Because it is, you're creating an intersection. So what this, uh, the CEP does is allows us to essentially query the event stream where we say, I'm interested in the event stream only for changes in products, which is a unique, uh, is, is a set from, from all of the intents that happen for the day, right? 
So, and, and those of you who know CP engines have used it will be able to relate to it. So, it really flips. So, you have a database, you have data address, then you execute the query. Here, the data is in motion and then your, your query is addressed. Right? You're basically applying a, a, a query on a stream that's going through. And uh, so let's move on to the data store. So what would help here, right? So we want to store large sets of data for products, users, tens of millions. Activity, which is whether he's doing a browse or a, you know, add to cart. And events per day, again, so some of this, tens of millions. And notifications, which depending on when the user is going to come and consume it, it could be in the order of maybe even up to 100 million. Why is that so? It's kind of maybe you got onto Flipkart, you're coming back after your your real time. There are some users who want to see it right away. There are guys who probably come back a week later, a month later. And ideally, you still want to show him like saying that, you know what, this product is maybe available at a reduced price. So it means that the notifications, you need to keep it for a very, very long time. Kind of like your timeline of, of Twitter. Right, you go to Twitter, you see tweets, latest tweets from people who are uh, there, who you are following. So it's a data store that needs to give very high write throughput, high read throughput for sets of data. So it means uh, how is that? It's both intent and also facts, right? So read throughput is when you're trying to match both these streams. So you got a product price change. You need to look who are all the users who expressed interest on this product. Right, so you need to be able to query that data store, saying that give me all users who who have expressed interest on this product. Right, so you need to be at, because we are doing saying that whenever there's a price update happening, you want to go and uh, determine this, compute, see if there is a change from what the user saw, compute compute a notification possibly for him, and then store that data. So you're trying to look at high write throughput, high read throughput, and you also want finally. Can you do high, uh, low latency reads on the user path when the user comes to Flipkart the next time, right? So if you're logged in and you you see the notification bell and you you click on it and and you see the data, right? So what can be suitable here? Uh, so we went to basics. We said, hey, let's look at HBase. Okay. Now the characteristics of the database itself is yes, it's a columnar store, but the way data is organized is quite interesting. Data is always organized in a sorted order, the row keys, right? And that data is stored together. So which means, uh, and it also has some sense of a cache. And we said that, look, we could probably get the best out of a data store a, in terms of read throughput or read latencies if we can hit memory, right? So serving data from memory is probably the fastest. And then if you have to disk hit disk, you're better off probably operating at disk transfer rates than at disk seek rates, right? So if you're doing a lot of disk seeks, you're going to be very slow. But if let's say you do a seek and you're able to stream out a lot of data together, probably that's the next best case as compared to memory, right? And all of the data that we're storing here, you'll see that none of them are a single lookup. All of them are, the easiest example is look at your inbox. When you get to an inbox, you always see one email, probably see tens of emails ordered by time, right? You might even group it elsewhere, but what you're always looking at is a set of data together. So you want to optimize for querying a set of data or a range of data together, right? And those of us who used uh, HBase here would know that it's efficient for range scans. You agree? Why is that efficient for range scans? I mean, you need to work a little bit around it. So the fact that it is an LSM uh, tree, a log structure merge tree, the chances of keeping data, related data together. So the way we construct even our row key is something like we say user ID. So the key is kind of made of user ID, a reverse timestamp, and also the, the product there. Okay, so when you're trying to query for a user, you're always saying, give me notifications for this user, and, and you want reverse timestamp because you're always interested in the most latest data upfront. Now, the way this goes onto the disk is when you're writing this data onto HBase, that other picture that tells you that first, of course, it writes the write ahead log and it also writes it to a mem store. And only after the mem store, it grows beyond a certain size, it gets written into a H file, right? Similarly, on the read path, you have something called the block cache. So data is surfaced into the block cache and then you read off it, right? So if you can try to leverage 
uh, this these memory stores and if you have to hit disk imagine hitting the disk where you probably you did a disk seek you're here now now all of this data can operate at transfer rates right so the cost of the seek essentially is amortized across the various transfers that's happening right so that's the approach we uh, really took with saying that uh, let's look at hbase so the tech stack uh, in order to realize all of this so intent capturing system so we have so for all intent that's happening via flipkart so if you're browsing a product we capture it using so we have this proxy uh, the topic of my last talk phantom which is a reverse proxy so we have code in the reverse proxy which goes and keeps appending and capturing this intent asynchronously keeps getting written out we also have some batch based system because it's trying to pull up data like wish lists and so on which is not we are okay with certain latency all of this feeds data as append intents into hbase on the product changes we have a system which when in our uh, backend uh, you know in our inventory planning systems and so on warehouse and system whenever changes happen these keep emitting events so we listen to those events we have uh, the event processing built on top of seda and uh, you know uh, uh, s per cep uh, using rapid mq for messaging this this I, i'll tell you why it is very low latency right because bulk of the work is actually happening here uh, it gets appended into the hbase store and this data so even if you see this complex of uh, the cep system we probably today run it at flipkart scale on just one vm which has probably four cores on right you're not crossing a whole lot because you're trying to do an intersection which is an in memory of the all products that are being held and then you're writing the data out in probably two different dimensions into hbase and and when you're trying to do the intersection you're querying hbase again resulting in range scans and all of your work is happening on the hbase cluster okay so once the notifications are created they're ready the serving path so we have a lot of other things that go into place so we uh, first is while we want to have low latency reads we don't want just because hbase is slow or you know we screwed up somewhere that we don't want user experience to suffer so all of the fetches happen through phantom so the the query uh, retrieval happens through that when we want to push it to a device it goes through flipcast which is a notifications uh, uh, broadcast system uh, tomcat simply serving the say get notification for a user okay and even at that scale so we probably run it on two boxes it is only doing io which is doing a hbase read and sending it back right uh, so here interesting we also use memcache and, and cdn why because the notification data is you say this is the product id this is the last price that we saw and this is the new price right only this data is coming from from hbase whereas other details like what is the product description what is its image image your best of serving from a cdn right so that comes from a cdn the product description comes from memcache because we a b3 look up for just that set of 20 products is probably going to be the fastest right you don't want to keep duplicating that data again and again right so a combination of these these systems are uh, on the serving path so uh, tech stack uh, the good thing uh, is you can build out a very similar system all of it is open source either public domain uh, when i say public domain uh, public domain non flipkart or in flipkart we have gone and open source this right uh, phantom is open source super batch seda is open source flipkart is open source again rapid mqs per and in this interestingly you can replace some of this with your you know your pet technology if you like that right here you can always someone can say that oh can i use cassandra here instead of hbase by all means right so instead of tomcat can i use jt yes so if rabbit mq you want to use kafka yes but i don't think kafka it's just an overkill to use kafka for something like this right uh, and this and i'm talking about a scale where uh, i mean like wifi is down but uh, though i said i've shown you the live uh, the only part here which is closed source is the serix system but that is very relevant to our uh, flipkart context for create target group generation but otherwise the rest of it is uh, you know use them now for operating such a system and keep it running you need a lot of uh, system that can aid in that right so one is when we launch it we we have a standard ab testing framework we've got a lot of user facing 
systems would know what an AV is, right? So you can always say 50% of my users are viewing notifications. Uh, that is the standard our uh, phantom dashboards, where if you see the, the query serving part, we are, okay, at this point the cluster was doing about 40 requests a second, and we were getting a uh, median of, But I, I, I was just checking before I got in here, it's so about 10 ms. So 10 millisecond reads from HBase. Okay, so you can, if it is used well, you can use it even for serving data uh, in real time. A uh, few more dashboards around keeping how your data ingestion is happening and, and these are uh, other dashboards you, which you need for determining, uh, you know, the business impact. The point I'm trying to make is for operating such a system, you still, when you want to run it on days on end, you need to have enough metrics and alerting to say um, how, how, how this is going to work and impact users. Uh, so users, user reaction, people like it. Uh, people have used this to buy products, discover products, uh, uh, use it a lot. And this last one I would still want to call out saying that somebody received a notification, they went and looked at it, they saw that it was a high price. They thought that we were trying to trick them. That leads us to what you can have as a problem in this system, which is about consistency challenges, I'll come to that in a bit. Uh, some of the pros, right, so it's low, very low latency read path, uh, resilience to failure, we are okay to not show notification, but not bring down the site, we have other things to bring down the site. Uh, scales well, because LSM trees, key value stores, CDN for images, and a, a, a marked difference is the thing of immutable facts, right, using immutable data, uh, stored in an append only database, uh, which allows the ability to recompute data. So, a lot of you who also use real time analytics and, and then some of even the newer, some of the programming languages will talk about immutable data structures, right? Uh, very useful construct. So, consistency challenges, HBase itself is a consistent data store, but the problem we had is uh, when this instant happened, before the person could come onto the website, probably the product got sold out because others came and bought it and we couldn't generate notification enough to go and invalidate what we had created for him, right? So there is an eventual consistency problem that resulted in it, but yeah, but those are cases maybe we can live with. And then there's this thing of, uh, you know, there's a perceived pre-creating notifications. You pre-create notifications even though the user may not even ever come back to you, but the cost of storage is so cheap that it doesn't even figure, right? We don't even have a dedicated cluster. It runs off our shared uh, uh, HBase cluster. Some references, uh, HBase, the definitive guide, so that's an ebook where you can work, uh, pick something on block cache. And very interestingly, the last thing about f Facebook messages, right? Uh, some of you might know that Facebook uses HBase for all of your messaging. So that kind of led us to even start thinking, saying, why are these guys using HBase on the read path? And explored, and then once we got to understand it a little better, uh, that really was the seed for us to really start thinking about such a, what was otherwise a columnar data store to try to serve uh, data for uh, online traffic. Uh, some of the other open source projects that you can leverage. Yeah, uh, that I've done. Uh, before we go to questions, just a little announcement. Uh, there's this thing called the Flash Talks that's going to happen in Auditorium 2 at 2 o'clock. Uh, we're giving you all an opportunity to talk for five minutes on something you're very passionate about. And we're going to get an audience from this community to auditorium number two at two o'clock. We've been making announcements. But if you want to speak, kindly put your name and the topic of what you're going to talk about for five minutes and come and hand it over to me at the end of the session. Now we're going to go over to questions. We have exactly eight minutes. Uh, questions, please put your hands in the air if you have a question. There's a question on screen. Yeah, uh, let me just try to. Wait, uh, I don't know the reference, so <laughs> there's a question on the screen, sir. Could you yeah, yeah, I, I will. Answering that. Okay, um, yeah, I was able to connect. Can someone just connect it back? Can I get to this? Oh, yeah, here it is. So you can see I was telling you about the low latency reads, right? So this is from a production thing. So the median is about 8 ms. Yeah, 8 ms reads at about 70 QPS. Right, so so that and and there's there's nothing else in this path. It's directly hitting HBase. 
Okay, so if that works for you, um, can yep. Where is the question? What's that? When is the next lot of Zoe coming? Okay. So, any other questions that are pertaining to this talk and presentation? Yes, all the way at the back, black T-shirt. Yes, please. Stay to. I, I choose to stay away from it. <laughs> Only take, take only Nothing on uh, Two things, uh, Sandeep Mukhopadhyay, Agni Software, Pune. Uh, two things that you didn't talk about is, one thing is about the schema, the user schema. How do you storing that data? That is pretty important. Another thing is that uh, you didn't talk about the triggers. Why didn't you use triggers, right? So, I heard something that there is HBs, there are triggers. And let's consider oh, you have sense. product catalog. You, can you put a trigger there and then you change the user data. Can you do that? If if you can do that, why didn't you use that? Sure. So first is on the schema. Uh, it's a good question. So when, when we write intent or uh, the fact data, we actually write it into two dimensions. One is the user dimension, rather is the product dimension. That's because if you go go back to how I said uh, HBase organizes data, right? So it is always in a in a naturally sorted order. So when you are sometimes trying to query this data from a user dimension, you still want data to be together. And there are instances where you are trying to query it from a product dimension, you still want data to be together. Now in this, of course, it's duplication of data, but like I said, disk is so cheap that it's it's, all, it's okay to go and store them uh, as duplicates, right? So not like a conventional. So don't use HBase like a as an RDBMS. Do understand what it can do, and sometimes this kind of uh, you know, duplicated data is perfectly all right. So what? And in terms of a schema, it's pretty straightforward because it's it's almost looks like a you know a sparse hash map. So we use we use a single column family, and we have pretty much all of the data that we want to store stored in one or more columns. So I don't think that is very. Uh, I mean, we we couldn't have done too bad either ways if we had uh, made any choices there. But largely, we do duplicate data. Because when we want rain scans to happen, we want rain scans to hit a lot of blocks of data together. Okay. Uh, co-process and, and, and triggers. Now, co-process fire when you when you update data. But here we also want to know what we want to update. So co-process wouldn't have helped us. Okay, so when you said triggers, I'm, I'm, I'm inferring that that's what you mean. Okay, so we want to do a lot of Query, scan query. So, if, if there's any way of doing more efficient scan queries, yes. We're going to go to another question now. Okay, so on the web, can we, you just repeat his question, sockets, please, if you don't know? Yeah, yeah. So, his question was, do we push data uh, to the user using web sockets on the, on the, you know, on the desktop? Uh, uh, the answer is no. Uh, what we do is we just have a long poll. So, these are just Ajax calls that are refreshing the data. Uh, whereas, because that pipeline exists, we can also use the same pipeline with the whole Seda pipeline to just push the notification to Flipcast and then Flipcast would even do a push notification to the end user. So, you can use the same pipeline to either push or pull. Sorry? Yeah, so the resources on our side, the fact that we protect our backend through, through Phantom, so if there are queries that are going to take a lot of time, and we also use the bulkhead pattern. So if you know Hystrix has this thing called, so Phantom uses Hystrix and Hystrix has this thing called bulkheads, right? So the number of threads that are at any point in time dedicated for just fetching this data are, are limited and that way we, we have a way of, of uh, containing it to a very large extent. Though we very rarely see those issues happening because by then the data is very often in the block cache and we'll be able to retrieve it quite fast. Our next question, please put your hand in the air if you have a question. Green shirt. Just just hold on, so we're gonna give you a microphone. How do you process multiple uh, notifications for the same product? Say let's say after some time there is another product price drop or price drop just cancelled out. Do you we we do go and invalidate that. So okay. the thing that we do is that's why every 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 event, a, every fact is stored in its pristine form, so that if required, a we we use it to to compute and invalidate the the notifications. Plus, 
because it is stored in its in its uh, you know as is form any corrections we can go and rerun that and and really recreate the data right so that allows us to do that we're going to take one more question all the way in the front white shirt so uh, just a couple of questions one was i think when you look at uh, uh, refreshing the data so so you have let's say product based modification which is when they went to but you know that could get imbalanced because the price goes up again. Uh, Can you hold the mic a little closer, yeah, please? Yeah, that was. Well, yeah, sorry. So, so uh, I, I think we are talking of one is the user initiated uh, notifications and the uh, product initiated uh, notifications. So we are saying that if, for instance, uh, product initiated notifications expire and and price goes up, there has to be a way for let's say the database to refresh the data we will again get so every price change on the catalog system comes to us so the catalog system doesn't know whether you are you are you have, you have stored any notification it just says see at this instant it's like your stock price right goes up goes down and, and that so it's just that someone is listening to the yeah, and, and okay so so essentially you have a way of sort of filtering out that so that there's no false uh, negatives for, for uh, let's say someone is wish list at a particular price and the price goes up He's not notified when he comes. Lost yes, we don't. Kind of thing. So those that, are the rules when it is finally when you apply the price change. So in this case, so it, it varies on the attribute that you're handling, right? So some of it can be stock availability. So in case of stock, it is an increase. In case of a price, it's a drop. So the yeah. The question was related to let's say uh, a global uh, low price. So for instance, if you have competing sites for the same product, is there a engine that actually you use which actually ensures that you are the lowest price uh, product? Okay, so that is outside of notifications per se. So that is our pricing engine, yeah. pricing crawlers. Uh, we do have such a system, but I'm not going to talk about that. But that doesn't fi find its way in this pipeline because that is really used as input to either the retailing team or the sellers to go and adjust their prices accordingly. But yeah, when th the idea of this system is when they do get those signals and then they go and make a change, you want to probably be able to inform your customers the fastest. That's the goal of of this. Okay, so we have a lot of people putting their hands up. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to cut you off. Uh, you.